You can't use metallics on a wet palette. It's the most stupid thing I've ever thought in my life. Two thin coats. It doesn't look as poppy or as bright. It is nothing but a tool for a purpose. If I do that with a triple zero, by the time I've loaded the brush and I've lifted it over to the model, the paint's already dry. If you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2,200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. And its daylight balanced color temperature of 6500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Hello everyone and welcome to Paint Perspective episode 73. Today we're going to be debunking miniature painting myths as well as that we'll also have our regular segments of course but first uh, some hobby updates from everyone. Paul how's the Blood Angels coming along? Very nicely thank you. That's the end of that. No, I, <laughs> no of course yeah. I'm so you, getting you, quite you, finished the, you finished the Phobos Lieutenant? I did yeah. Yeah, oh, probably there's a picture there. Yep. I would imagine, George, that you're going to put there. So, yeah, you can see that, everybody. Admire it. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, no, it was good. I really enjoyed that. Good. good. I yeah. saw it. It looks really, really great, dude. How, how how did you find going from the captain to that? Like, how have you... Easy peasy. Okay, that answers that one. Yeah, All right. no, no, moving, so, on. moving on. Moving <laughs> on. Yeah. Obviously, the, the, the captain was a bit more involved, I suppose. Uh, it was a bit more, bit more of an in-depth look at into actually just like, I don't know, painting red. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Did you find it similar to when you said you'd painted the Skaven Vizic model? Did you find that because the one you'd painted previously was a bit bigger, a bit more ornate, had more going on, that it felt a bit yeah, easier because yeah, it was I mean, just a simpler model? Yeah, we've touched on this before. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, everything compared to that from <laughs> since painting that has been a bit of a, not like a breeze. You can but, paint it in your sleep. Yeah, more yeah. or less. Well, but in I mean, terms of like Blood Angel specifically, because obviously mm. you painted the Captain before, which is a bigger, busier model with extra yeah. detail and stuff. So going to a model with maybe a bit more stripped back in that regard, yeah. did it just feel a bit more smooth? Uh, I, I actually, th I mean, for this uh, Lieutenant, there's a lot more sort of smaller details on, on this one. Mm -hmm. I noticed there's, you know, he's got a lot more grenades. Um, I can't remember what else was on it. There's a, he's got lots of little trinkets. There's some the tyrannid dead tyrannid parts. bits and pieces. Yeah. yeah. So there's, a few, and obviously with the weapon slung around the back, there's a few more pouches on him and things like that. So I think uh, from that kind of point of view, he was trickier than the captain. Because mm. I know the captain was a Terminator and he's got uh, a cape and all the rest of it, but they were kind of big, open, flat areas, which were. Which were obviously prevent uh, pre uh, present their own challenges. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this, one, I definitely felt like the red armor this time round was quicker to paint. Yeah, because I, you know, kind of getting used to the recipe and things like that, and getting that down. Yeah, you dialed in, as we I, say. Well, I, I think like I spoke to you about it the other, the other day. I sort of raised this kind of a weird question where, after painting the armor, sort of the day after coming back to the painting table all my highlights seem to have sort of disappeared overnight. Yeah. <laughs> I was sort of wondering what, what's going what's going on with that? Because, you know, I sit there for hours, Payne's like trying to do me edge highlighting and I think, oh, this looks great. And then the next day, it doesn't look as poppy or as bright as the day that was as the previous day. So when you say disappeared, you just mean when the paint was drying, it was like more desaturated than you were I don't expecting. know even, well, I mean, I, I mean, I do use a hairdryer to, to, to dry things as well. Yeah. So it's not as though I'm sort of, the, the paint is wet and it oh, I look, looks great there and I don't notice these things. Are you looking at it under like, your painting light or are you not looking under your painting light? Yeah, always. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah it's fair. Probably, that's probably why is it? It's because I'm used, not looking, especially, yeah, I mean, you're right. I When it's under a, a nice bright daylight lamp, it looks great. Yeah, I think the thing is, is that don't forget that like when you, you and your eyes are accustomed to painting a model and you're looking at it for X amount of time indefinitely, like yeah. while you're doing a session, you 
your eyes, it's almost, it is eye muscle memory. It becomes your eyes muscle memory to the model and you get super granular on all the little bits because you're yeah. studying it so in depth. The, the colors that you take in the colors, the details, the way you've applied the paint, all those kind of things. And then when you step away from it for X amount of time and come back mm. to it, your eyes have adjusted back to just normal looking, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and you also, you're not looking at it. That first glance that you have at it again is not as granular as when you're in, intently looking at it while you're painting. I suppose, yeah, that makes so, sense, yeah. um, that, that actually is actually very good for painting because it, you, you, it almost gives you a bit of a kick and go, oh, actually, yeah, that's look really good. Mm. And then as you stare at it more, that's when you start noticing yeah. things. So like, don't forget that when people see your model, unless it's a model for like a painting comp or something like that, and it's getting super scrutinized and it's looking at it that way. Um, that, that first glance that people see of it is always going to be, they're not going to know all the little, little things that you've yeah. been like, like fascinating over while you're painting it, if that makes sense. Mm. So, so that's probably the reason why same with colors, like you, 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 have this oh, i want to get to this saturation i want to get it to look like this or whatever um you, you're probably looking at it again with eyes not in that way does that yeah. make sense that, that might be that i don't think the color is, is changing color you know no what I mean? like, no but, but, but I, I i thought well i can't go any brighter with the highlights because like the top highlight that i'm using on, on the red is ice yellow yeah no, i can't really go any brighter than that yeah yeah to make things other the only other way is to paint the whole edge in ice yellow <laughs> yeah and it's, it's not gonna it's not gonna look well to me it wouldn't look that great so no exactly but um no fair i mean okay i mean that makes that that's I mean, good it's good that the models progress quite yeah. substantially which and is also good. i noticed um another area that i need to um perhaps do a bit better in is after because george kindly took some pictures of it <laughs> and i know it i noticed two mold lines straight down the fronts of the shins Ouch. and i thought I, I I've spent ages sanding these things, but and I, I was painting for hours on it, didn't see it. I still and so obviously didn't see them at all. And then George took these pictures, and I thought the first thing I can see is two mold lines going down the legs, and now I can't unsee those. It just scrape. I it think off. I think no, it's one of those things again. where like you uh, you know like people say nose blind. I yeah, think you kind of get that for miniatures sometimes when yeah. you're building and painting them. Yeah. Like there'll be a glaring mistake, something that you've missed. And it's not that you're not paying attention or that you're not bothered, but like they just somehow they just blend in, and then you show someone else, and then and they go, "Oh, look!" That's that's, that's, that's yeah. where fresh eyes is really helpful. Yeah, you have that break, your eyes reset, they go back to normal looking, and then you look at it again. Yeah, like um, I, yeah, having a fresh eye section of time is well, really, really good. Well, how did I miss? I've been looking at it for for, <laughs> yeah. for a solid you know a week and a half or whatever. One thing that I'll do with um, typically like only with display pieces, I won't really do it for gaming stuff, but mm. I like to at the end of building it and cleaning it. Before I prime, I like to just take a photo on my phone, like at the hobby desk, sleep on it. Next yeah. morning, rather than looking at the model, I'll look at the photo. Yeah, and I'll yeah. zoom in and like dart around and see if I that can find any mistakes idea, of it. Because yeah. you've not only got fresh eyes, but you're not looking at the model. You're looking at a photo of the yeah. model where you can like zoom in and pixel peep and, and really be granite, yeah. really, really. Yeah. Well, I, I've yeah. got the next one on the on the table. So what's that? Um, or do, do you, you know wanna... the combat patrol? Yes. The the new the Hellblaster chap. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the Infernus Marine, yeah. the limited one from the Combat Patrol that's it, magazine. That's right. yeah, 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 so I've got that. Uh, he's I've sort of changed a few parts. So he's a Blood Angel. And he's got a Blood Angel shoulder pad, and you know, a couple of other. Not that I'm interested in Blood Angels, but it's just been quite fun. <laughs> um, you can, so, you, so you, you can say it. Come on, you're, 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 you're amongst you're, friends. You're amongst yeah. friends. You're in a support group. So, uh, the I'll, first step <laughs> to knowing that you have a problem is, is it, admitting yeah. it. Got to admit it. You got a problem. Uh, so yeah, he's on the table. So I, I spent after seeing that that those pictures and thinking, oh my god, I, <laughs> I, everyone's going to see that now. So I spent an awful long time just sanding those shin pads because the, the, the mold lines on that are quite heavy. Yeah. So um, so I'm sort of adapting the way that I put things together now as well. Sort of focusing a bit more on that, you know, the, the sort of the, the planning stage and working out how things go together and. What yeah, is your uh, mold line cleaning tool of choice? Um, well, a scalpel. I've got like a scalpel with a sharp blade sharp to blade. sort of take off most of it. Agree. I agree. Uh, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in camp sharp blade. I've used both. I use sharp and also blunt. So It's not blade. attached to a drill or anything. No, so. it's not. <laughs> Forklift. <laughs> uh, Just and a, then, a scalpel blade coming here, yeah, model 4,000 <laughs> RPM. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and then after that, I'm sort of hitting it with um, some really fine sort of sandpaper. Those, I think yeah. we spoke about it last time. Is on those Sanding kind of, foam. Yeah, or yeah sanding I've got sticks. some of those. So They're really good. Um, I've been have, yeah, been using those to, to find it. But even though I, I mean, it, it feels completely smooth. 
but I'm really worried now that even though it feels completely smooth and, you know, going down to the level and it seems I can see a little bump on. Like, yeah. Once you prime it though, like people forget, you're not like locked in to the painting space. Yeah, like, oh, I, I, you I can, primed it now. I, I can't actually, do anything Well, no, I actually think that's a, that's a, a, that's a benefit because the thing is you, if you prime it, mm. priming it actually sometimes shows up mold lines. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, yeah, yeah. so I, what I tend to do is, and it's part of the, my process is I'll literally, I'll clean it as best as I can, undercoat it, give it a check under a lamp and see if yeah. there's anything I missed because ultimately it's a layer of paint on the model. So as you put progressive layers of paint on the model, then it's, it, you're going to, you'd, you'd, it'd be better to check it and for mold lines and stuff at that point yeah. rather than when you get the next coat That's, on. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. the prime actually helps you or the undercoat helps you because then you can just spot them quick skim with a knife or a bit of sanding foam, reprime that area. Job yeah. Done. So, so, so yeah. yeah. And but, similarly as well, like don't forget what I, what I said as well, you can take photos of the model once it's primed and like zoom yeah. in and have a look. I think I'll, yeah, I think I will this time. Just to, but you um, can go back and sand stuff. Like you're not locked in yeah. at any point in the process. Even when you start painting, if you notice late on and 75 percent of the model's there. painted, it's never too late. To yeah, just sand it, paint over it. Yeah, no, I, I did drill through one of the one of the, <laughs> the arms. I, I was going. I was drilling through the shoulder to put a, a paper clip in for my uh, you know sub assemblies. And drill through the pad and well no I, I was dr sort of drilling from the shoulder down towards the elbow and I, I, was, I was drilling away you know listening to something on, on YouTube and then uh, I sort of took the drill bit out and then when I looked at the arm there's a little tiny hole sticking out of the elbow <laughs> went too far I went yeah. to yeah only, only a little bit so I get the green stuff out and put that in that's fine no one will notice that one um, but uh, we've yeah. all done it <laughs> yeah, <we've> all done. <laughs> um, so I've done that um but yeah, going back to the lieutenant, it gave me a couple of little a bit of opportunities as well to try a few other new things. Like I tried to do some like sort of muzzle burn on the on the flamer. On the yeah, that's good. Um, so I tried to do a bit of that. Um, leather so, and the leather, yeah, on the pouches, trying to do some sort of old sort of leather look. Looks I really good. like just, what you've done for the leather, yeah, like the sort I of warm it's and just, scratch yeah, look. I, it looks really nice. I tried to do no sort of solid color, so there's. There's no solid color. It's just all kind of different patchiness. Little, yeah, you know, squiggly yeah. marks. But like the actual like, tones and colors have used, I think work really yeah, well for good. selling like warm leather. I mean, it was it wasn't anything special. I think it was. I think I used dried bark, mourn fang, um, and then some other lighter color on the top, which I can't remember the name of. <laughs> That's fun. Um, but so, so it was. I mean, I'm I'm trying to at the moment not really mix colors too much. Mm. Um, using straight color. I'm just using straight color yeah. just to. Yeah, and sort of bit sort of build layers that way. Can I unpack why is your doing that? Um, because well, I think I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm no, just no, curious like, as to how you landed on that. It, well, I, I think partly it's just uh, trying to be consistent across. If I was to paint more Blood Angels, mm -hmm. it would be quite nice to have if, them. If when Paul when, <laughs> when? <laughs> well, it's already happening, isn't it? So as I'm painting more, it'd be it's quite nice to have them. All consistent. Yeah, yeah, of course. And yeah. I think if if I'm mixing random colours up, it's you're not going to remember. Yeah, Are you writing down your recipe? Are you no, of course it? not. Well, I, I mean, I, I have got, <laughs> <laughs> I have got. George gave me uh, his little recipe for Blood yeah, Angel yeah. armor. Yeah, yeah. So that's I've already got that saved. You're uh, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's one good thing. So I've been using that. Um, to do my, although it's a little bit more simplified than George's one because he's, you know, he's got mixing shades and all that. So <laughs> I'll use, uh, I'll just use the, some of the colours, but, um, um, and then everything else, like the leather and weapons and bits and pieces, that's quite easy to remember anyway because okay. if you're using well, those Now bits, it is in six, 12, 18, 24 months. Yeah, but if I'm doing I've, things There's so many times where I've been like, this is a recipe I use all the time. I'll it's always locked in. This, yeah. I'll always know yeah. that. Yeah. What, so that memorable. Well, no, I, already can't later. <laughs> <laughs> I already can't remember the colour for the, the, the final highlight for the leather. So, yeah. But I've got those. Th what I might do is, is have like a, 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 a box, a Blood Angel paint box. So I keep all my Blood Angel colours in there. You know, you could just write a list of all and then you... Could, and then, well, and then you yeah, I could do. If I must have to uh, get a journal. Yeah. Maybe sort it out. Maybe, yeah. And uh, and <laughs> and uh, go from there. Yeah. It would be handy to write these things down. I should do, really. Um, and do, you know, so perhaps some colour swatches and things like that. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Mm. Fair. Yeah. Good. I'm glad, the, I'm glad the, 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 the journey or the embarkation of the journey yeah. of the Blood Angels has been good. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how it good. goes. But I, for the moment, I am quite enjoying painting them up, painting them up like Blood Angels, yeah. Good. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. I have come to a decision 
about my time and painting. I'm going to graciously bow out of any armies. They're all going on hold. Do you hear that, Joe? We won. <laughs> Auto automatic I, win. I, I, will, won. I will still be trying to get them done at some point in the future. Mm. However, I am. We spoke on a previous episode about Golden Demon and competitions. Yeah. Um, I really want to push my painting and paint a lot of stuff that I've not painted before and do a lot of things that I've not painted before after going to going to Germany. Uh, henceforth, I am solely going to be focusing on competition stuff. Moving You've got forward. the competition bug. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Everyone does this when they come back from a competition. Yeah. A couple of weeks yeah. later, they're like, I think I'm just going to do this. But yeah. Don't worry, James. The, the army bug will but, yeah. hit you. But, future tense. But I will be doing bits from the models that I've got. So of my plethora of tanks, <laughs> I will be doing a tank as an entry. Mm. Because your reaction to, oh, you're doing a Mordian tank. I am going to be doing a Mordian tank as a yeah, competition nice. entry. So I cool. am, yeah. I am, yeah, I really, really want to spend the remainder of 24 and 25 focusing on painting stuff that I'm not used to or stuff that scares me. Are um, you but, planning on painting them in any different way as well, like using different mediums and whatnot? Yeah, I'm really going to be experimenting with a lot of stuff because I think that I've for too long, I've seen improvement in painting over the over the last couple of years, et cetera, but I'm really going to, I'm really going to try and do a lot of stuff that I haven't done before. I'm finally going to try and conquer the Everest or the fear thing for me, which is do a non-metallic metal model fully. Yeah. To so do a full non-metallic metal model. That's something that's on the list. On the flight back, I wrote a load of things, like a load of bullet points of things that I'm scared of, which sounds silly, but I, that's just how it is. That uh, and, and just things that I want to do. So that's yeah. my, that's my, my mantra for the next hey, year, year, and, year, and a, year and a half. Yeah. That's, that's basically what I'm going to be doing. Um, I, I think am, that's a positive thing to do though. Cause even if you're not looking to necessarily just do competition stuff, no, just taking a yeah. sit back and say I need to paint some new things that I haven't done before. Yeah, yeah. I think is really important. Or try yeah. new new yeah. things as well. And I have also, I also, I've timed this hopefully appropriately. If, please don't release any more, more Blood Angel stuff, Games Workshop. Um, I have also. <laughs> Hang said, on a minute. No, we can't just no. say don't release more Blood yeah, Angel stuff because you're tapping out. We've been yeah. waiting years for this. It finally comes along. James okay. is like that will do. We've got, we've got we've got a load of stuff. Blood Angel fanboy as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do I can't add with You're like the poster much. boy of the Blood Angels, and you're like whoa, 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 whoa guys. Look, I'm I'm just conscious that there are other factions, Elder, Cough, Elder, that haven't had models for a very long time. But the, true. But the thing is, is like all I am restricting myself to painting only one piece for the next sixteen months. It's gonna be Blood Angels as well. So uh, as in for comp. So I'm going to do one entry that is going to be a Blood Angel and that is it. Everything else is going to be mm, not Blood Angels. Not Blood Angels wow. as well. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, because I just I just yeah. need to that. So that's that's kind of what, and I think the thing is, is like I've got all these models for these various armies that I wanted to do and all this kind of stuff. If I really need to tap out and have some time away from more intense stuff or stuff that's creative or learning or trying to do stuff, I can always jump on and, and just pick those things up. So like, I will be still painting the exemplars of Siege and like my Blood Angels and like my audience. I will still be doing stuff, but just it won't be like to this goal and and like the like this challenge thing of the army. Like, I, I just I really want to focus on those things moving forward. I think mm. they really because the thing is, it's only going to hopefully fingers crossed. Like when I done my very first squad uh, on my Blood Angel squads years ago, where I pushed myself and done loads of stuff that I hadn't done before on it. I see a huge growth in in what I could do with that, and then it filtered back down into all my other painting. So. Mm. Time is a currency as well that you're spending and you've only got a certain amount to go around, I, I, I assume. Yeah, we've here, yeah, with dogs, with yeah. all that kind of stuff. And I, I, do, I was just trying to, I think from lots of the conversations we've had over various episodes of recent, it's just, you know, I said about sitting at a desk and planning. Yeah. But I literally sat on those flights on the, the way there and the way back. And I thought to myself, like, what am I trying to achieve and what am I actually, what is my goal with what the time that I do have available to paint? I've like, I kind of feel like obviously I've said all this stuff on the podcast and I feel that I've, even though that's what I firmly believe, I feel that even my own painting, I've been neglecting that a little bit. Mm. You've got to like hold yourself up to your own standards. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I, I just one thing to say on a podcast, but your actions need to no, speak exactly, to your advice. Exactly, speak, yeah. Don't they? yeah. And, and I'm literally like, I'm literally like, right. Okay. So I kind of like, I think invest in that, like that time into experimenting trying pushing yourself doing those things like i've been i feel like 
I've got a little bit complacent with my painting and as much as I love Blood Angels and that's uh, what uh, it's, it's a bit of a joke when I go to comps because like, oh what have you entered oh Blood Angel uh, yeah, mm. yeah I, 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 as much as that is I love I do like that because I like that I want to enter stuff that I'm super passionate about I do also feel that like my love for that stuff is actually stopping me from progressing more and and I think you could it, only learn to edge highlight red so many ways exactly yeah exactly yeah and like Again, all those other things that I practice and do on other other models will only benefit the thing that I love mm-hmm. because it will make that better. So yeah. I think I kind of need to eat eat the meal that I'm cooking, so to speak. Yeah. Wow. All right. Okay. And 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 <laughs> and and actually live by those words for the next X amount of time. And as yeah. I said, like I'll still paint. I'm still committed to doing the exemplars because I love that chapter and I want to do it. Um, but um, but yeah, I just uh, yeah. So I've already been thinking of loads of li- loads of entries. I've already got a long list of things that I. That I'd love to do, and 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 I'm embarking on that pretty pretty sharpish. So so yeah, it's it, nice having these conversations on the podcast because it does. When other people serious. say stuff, it does get the the wheels turning a little yeah. bit, and you do stop and sit and think about things differently. Yeah, well, it's nice when it happens. Sometimes it happens like live on the podcast. You kind of have these realizations, but then other times it's like two days later afterwards. Mm. Yeah, you say your painting desk, and then like you can just sort of hear that voice this yeah. is like you trekking into the mountains to find yourself I think yeah so I, I, was while, on the, I said I was sitting on the plane I had nothing yeah. I had nothing I, you know I, I, I had nothing else to do and, and I, I'm not the biggest fan of flying but like I was just like what can I do to kind of like not think about all the possible things that could happen and like uh, <laughs> like, uh, and, and I was just like oh, I just, and, and that was it I was just like so yeah I started writing a list of projects and stuff that I wanted to paint I've got this uh, diorama that I've wanted to do for a long time I started building it started making it got all the old models that I wanted for it and it just sat there and I was like that's something that I've always wanted to do. So, so yeah, like there's, there's, there's lots of little things. And I, I just think that I needed to kind of like have that reflection. I think it's really important. And, um, and yeah, like I'm still going to do my armies and stuff, but I just don't, I don't, I don't want the pressure of having to just do stuff to an acceptable standard for the army to push that down the road a little bit without mm. actually looking and going, okay, well, what is, it's really hard. I always go through this. I go through a phase where like, I want to do comp stuff, want to do armies, want to do comp stuff, want to do armies. And I think, yeah, like, I think I've got to that juncture again, where it's like, I've painted lots of stuff recently, started building stuff for armies, started doing that, but it's not going to, it's not going to. But isn't that like, that's a, that's a healthy hobby balance balance is maybe doing, yeah yeah i don't think it needs to be like a permanent yourself. thing either yeah. like it ebbs and flows doesn't it like yeah. there might be one year where you're really into comp stuff and then mm. the next year where there's a new release or you just get the you just the bug for paint. it and you want to do something else and just paint for enjoyment yeah I, mm. all the stuff i saw there and all the stuff that i saw going uh, for, uh like uh that going to do and i was like like uh, every year i disappoint myself whereby i don't paint something 100 percent, or i don't have a proper run-up to demon or i don't have a proper run-up to competitions because i'm juggling stuff i'm busy here i've got dog training i've got all that i'm like I just want to commit to that. I think having that commitment to it is only going to serve me better in the terms of how I paint moving forward. And then I can always revisit doing armies and stuff fully and invest 100% of the time I have available mm. into it. So yeah. I don't the, think it's just that. I think it's the importance of, like you said, painting different stuff yeah. in a different yeah. way yeah. because it might not necessarily be the way you want to paint everything moving forward. And it, it might not even be that if, say you painted an AOS model in a completely different style, you might never want to do that again, but you might have learned something about brush control or something about blending yeah. technique mm-hmm. that you can then apply yeah. elsewhere to other stuff. So I think like diversifying and exploring other stuff can be yeah. really, really positive. I, I, I want to live by my own words and, and I, as more even closer and I want to be outside my comfort zone, paint stuff I'm not used to and just um, and then the thing that I am used to that I love can be like the reward for doing it. So that single blood angel comp entry that I'm going to do again it's a character model that i've always wanted to paint uh, not it's not it's a character i want to make and i want to just make my own model um uh that will be the reward for everything so i need mm. to balance those two things so yeah, yeah. that's going to be what i'm doing do forward. you think having uh gone to golden demon that like, looking at the winners and entries there has influenced this decision a little bit um it always Seeing does what it, other it, people it, are it always does but the thing that happens is i come back mm. get back into the ebb and flow of of siege and get back into the ever flow and like my, what the stuff that I'm just tinkering at at home and I don't fully commit. Yeah. And when, even though I, look, even though the form of fest in 23, I committed to getting Dante done in time frame to do it. Obviously everyone knows about the whole, the hotel painting morning and after work, morning, morning and night before whatever, but that I fully committed to that. And I was like, right, I'm going to get it. And I, even though I wasn't hundred percent happy with it, I still presented, but in mm-hmm. this time I want to combine the experience I had in the lead up to MPO where I had everything presented and, and I was happy with everything as well as a proper run up. Does that yeah. make sense? I, I've never, never really dedicated myself to it 
100 percent mm. and i i'm quite sick of not doing that being honest so like i just yeah that's that's my decision i'll just you know so it's yeah, I'm, 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 I'm fully relying on you, George, to carry the flag across the line. You know, <laughs> well, and Paul now, apparently. Paul now, yeah, you can, I, you can. The other question I want to ask about this is because obviously given our past discussions about competitions and things, yep. and it's been more about the taking part, yep. to, you know, depending on your level and things like that and accepting that you might not get an award yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. learning about oh, yourself way, improving about none of this is with yeah. the, uh, i just want to caveat this now none of this is with the expectation of even doing well this is purely but are you are you i mean you're, you obviously want to push yourself and push your patents i just want to get better like i don't yeah. it's not a case of it's not a case of oh i hope i win a trade like like yeah. being being frank like uh, we said that in the other episode and i don't want to turn this into just a competition chat but like being frank like that's never when i was younger that winning one was like the dream of course yeah. And, yeah and then obviously i was very privileged for that to happen and like as i said like even though i've had conversations about it but like i'm still very very happy that i've done that and i've achieved that and very privileged to have done so but i never I, I stick firmly to what i said in that previous episode whereby i don't i don't think mm. that should be the goal i think that yeah. the, the what you present and the quality and the and is should be the reward the, and, the, and the yeah, goal. improving as a painter and, and enjoying painter. the process yeah, exactly. importantly as well, yeah. the enjoyment of yeah. it like that should be if if anything comes to, from it, yeah, yeah. amazing. That's a bonus. That's a right? bonus. But yeah, but yeah do you know I how much fun I have painting competition pieces? But I know that the competition is like six months away. Like, because even if you're <laughs> panic painting, getting better or whatever, like enjoying it, I think is the most important thing. Yeah, and painting competition pieces can be really, really enjoyable. Mm. The thing that makes it stressful is expectations and time. Yeah, if you give yourself plenty of time to do it, yeah. and you remove those expectations. It's a very, very enjoyable process. At the end of mm. it, you have a lovely display piece that you can be proud of. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you would have improved as a painter. Yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. And so that that's that's basically what I'm going to be doing. Um, and I'm going to stick to and commit that. Mm. And and whether I only get to because I don't have loads of time every evening to paint. But if I could chip away and go an hour a night or, you know, uh, you know, in around teaching and see you know, if I can chip away at stuff and get, you know, a couple of pieces that I'm really proud of and like uh, there's no painting before there's in the lead up I can do it gives me the virtue of time in the lead up so that I can have the fresh eye gap which was we were talking about yeah have those fresh eyes and then if I want to do a little tweak here and there in a the couple of weeks in the lead up to an yeah. X competition I can do rather than oh I've got to paint or oh, take all my paints with me to the hotel I've got to take my daylight I've got to set up in the hotel like I'm just done with that like mm. it's so I'm so sick and tired of, of doing that and putting myself in that position and the stress and the like it just it just is so I'm just annoyed at doing that to yeah. myself like um so well, I think it's right that you're taking accountability for it and you're trying to yeah. change like the Oh input. yeah, hundred percent. It's all on me. It's all yeah. on me. Because the thing is I, I butterfly around. Like, you know, we all have these piles of potential gray chain, whatever the hell you want to call it, stack, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like, but like I think, yeah, I needed that time on the reflection. Flights are always good for me when I do that. I always have to, like, I always try and have to think about stuff as deeply as I can on flights because I try you don't to want to look out the window. I don't want to look out the window. Well. Yeah, but 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 <laughs> but um but but I think that was yeah, I think that's that's something I realized. And like I said, like I've got Lots of people I know, and lots of people with friends. I started started entering uh, at the same time, and like that, that that their their focus obviously is is there's comp painting. And they haven't got this thing to run and what and all this mm. other, other stuff and all this other. That. So I just I just want to be honest to myself about my expectations. I can't have expectations of improving or doing better in comps if I'm not putting the hours or the work in. No, true, yeah, you know, yeah. and I think that's just a falsehood that I need to just take like you said take accountability for and actually go right well if i want to get better and do better then the only way to do that is by putting the time in true yeah. um, and then that that means sacrifice and the sacrifice is not painting a full army of audience not painting a full army of exemplars not painting a full bunch of primaris mm. army my first born <sighs> army not getting any more paint or put on it and staying as it is for god knows how much longer like that's just a sacrifice that needs to be made and and and, and you can't do everything you know and no. i think that you need to to focus and that's what i want to do so yeah. so yeah you're one person with one paintbrush at a time aren't you yeah yeah pretty much yeah, exactly. so you can only do exactly. one thing at a time exactly so. yeah, yeah. So, or we're in one thing at a time. Well, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, true. yeah, yeah. So that's that's basically the decision I've made. So for anybody hoping to see the Mordian army, I am sorry. Um, and as that may, as long as we see some Mordians, yeah, there will be, there will the be. Year, yeah, be it, right, it, 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 as much as it pains me to say, it, uh, yeah. I, I just need to, I need to be honest with myself. And I think that's the that's the 
that's what I want to do. Mm. So. Maybe the the lesson to learn there is like maybe everyone could have a little bit of introspection, have a think about what you want to improve and set some some goals perhaps. Yeah. Go on maybe. a flight. Go on a flight. It works. <laughs> it works. But maybe yeah. just like acknowledging some things that it, it's all well and good saying, here's one thing I want to change about the hobby. Here's one thing I want to improve. One thing I want to get better about one goal that I want to accomplish. But setting yourself up and, and understanding what it is you need to do to get there. If you get yeah. what I mean, like making a plan for it, like rather than just having this sort of distant thing that you're just sort of blindlessly striving towards, stop and say, okay, here's what I want to achieve. Here are the things that I need to do to achieve mm, that. Yeah. Um, here are the changes that I need to make yeah. in what yeah. I'm doing with my painting to get better at X technique. Yeah. Here's what I need. I think I need to practice and so on and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very true. We frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world-class and award-winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about, and we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day, all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles, and techniques from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios debunking miniature painting myths so i think there are a lot of sort of stereotypes for certain techniques products and things like that that i think are common for beginners perhaps but i think some people hear or read take them as fact and it kind of never leaves their mind if that makes sense mm -hmm. without any evidence to support it necessarily right so what i've done is i've compiled a little bit of a list mm -hmm. of some of the common things that we hear from like uh, beginner painters and more intermediate painters and perhaps even advanced painters as well. A lot of these are things that I've thought myself previously mm. and not necessarily taken the time to fact check or stop and think about or yeah. have a conversation or discussion about. So um, I think we're going to go through these as like a bit of a itemized list and we'll tick some of these I off. Hopefully to, we can yeah. debunk some myths. Well, I have to say, just looking at your list before we talk about any of these, um, as a quite newish painter, um, I can... I can see on there that most of these things that you've got written down, yeah, I'm finding out over the course of my little painting journey that it's it's all rubbish, and I'm finding <laughs> out that these, that yeah, all these little things here, um, yeah, we can debunk all these easy peasy. Nice. Mm. Okay. Uh, the first one I've got on my list yeah. is small details require a smaller brush yeah rubbish next one <laughs> <laughs> james you're mr brush control so yeah why don't I, you take, this, take the floor for this one so i've often gone on about using a bigger brush and uh i do think it's a bit of a fallacy that you need to have a smaller brush to do a smaller detail mm. a bigger brush gives you way more options when you're using the brush as in like the load that the, the, the takes paint and lasts longer the moisture retention of a bigger brush it means it'll perform for longer you'll get, it won't dry out as quick just through oxidization of paint evaporating or moisture evaporating from a smaller brush um all that kind of stuff um it's like you, with a bigger brush you can do all the things that you can do with a smaller brush if it's like the tiniest 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 and i mean like almost like like a, a quadruple zero. Like, well, like, I'm talking tiny about ones. like if you're trying to put like a reflection dot maybe in a pupil on an eye or something like that, I wouldn't go in there steaming with like a size six or something like <laughs> that. Like, you know, um, I probably would drop a brush size um, uh, as in like go to a much smaller brush potentially for something that tiny. Um, but having said that, like depending on how good the point is on the brush and also the balance of your pressure management or brush control of the brush, I've seen people do dots in in pupils with larger brushes you know it's it's a case of obviously that you get muscle memory and used to the tool that you're you're using for for painting and really like i just think there's a lot of benefits uh that come with using a bigger brush and i think that it's almost like walking down the street with crutches when you've got perfectly fine legs if you feel and think that you need to use a smaller brush to do much smaller details hmm. like um, i think one thing that it discounts is it's not necessarily so much about the physical size of the brush. It's about the the tip. Yeah. Because when you're painting really, really fine, small details and you need that precision, mm. it's the tip that's the important part. And you'll find typically that with high quality brushes, especially 
Larger ones still have as fine and as sharp of a point as a tiny brush. However, they're going to not dry out as quick. They're going to hold more paint. Yeah. And you're going to have more working time with them. Whereas if you take like the real extremes, for example, like say like size six, seven massive brush, but it's got a really nice fine sharp point. If you look at literally just the end of that, it's identical to mm. a double zero or a triple zero. So there's no reason you shouldn't in theory be able to execute those tiny precise things. I think for me, choosing a brush size is about fitting it on the model. So if, because they're three dimensional models and they're posed quite dynamically, typically it's getting access to the area so, that I yeah, need I know without mean, yeah. worrying about hitting Touching obstacles hard. in the way, yeah. if that makes sense. So if I'm trying to paint into like, you know, a, a crevice on like an arm or something, I obviously don't want a massive brush because it's going to hit him in the chest on the way yeah. over there. So there is for me a choice there in terms of just finding something appropriate for what I'm trying to do so that I can get access to that. But within that, I'll typically be going for like, what's the biggest brush I could get away with using for yeah. this rather than what would be the easiest thing to do, for example. Yeah, I'm definitely moving away from, cause I was to completely, almost completely reliant on a triple zero and, you know, like the lower, real small brushes, even just doing like edge highlights and things. But now I'm, I'm sort of moving up the sizes and I normally sort of stick to a size two or a zero. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying about the, you know, the point about the points is um, I, I, as I'm getting better brush control, which obviously I am, um, I'm yeah moving away from that. And actually I, when I do need to use a triple zero, I do still use a triple zero for doing eyes yeah. and things like that. Um, and and there's nothing like wrong with yeah, that, but I think it's but, I think it's breaking the breaking the like the the the, the not stigma is not the right word, no, but, not, but breaking the, like the illusion that you you have to use yeah, one. Sure. Do you know what I mean? It's like it, ultimately it's the point of the brush that puts the paint on the model for details like yeah. that. And if you can control a bigger point, yeah, or a bigger belly with a sharp point on it, That's it then yeah. there's a, not really much marginal difference between those two yeah. things. If that makes sense, and it's realizing as well that those. It's not just an exercise for the sake of an exercise. It's not you're not like doing Mr. Miyagi like routines. It's the the point is it makes your life easier. You realize yeah. that those smaller brushes are fighting you because yeah. as you're painting, they're drying out. You're starting to yeah. introduce texture onto the models. You've got less working time. Even with eyes, for example, hmm. I might look to paint an eye of like a size two or something because I know that I want to spend a bit of time getting my hand in the right position, making sure I'm comfortable, bracing my hands, yeah. getting ready to paint that eye because it's yeah. a very very small and precise detail. If I do that with a triple zero, by the time I've loaded the brush and I've lifted it over to the model, the paint's already dry. I know. I was just, and I'm starting to like stab him in the face with just this dry like, toothpick of paint. I was just, just going to say, yeah, even I, even now I'm finding that I'm because I'm getting used to the, using the bigger ones, when I do go back to use a smaller brush, the paint is dried before I get yeah. it there. And I'm, 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 it's, it's, I'm having more trouble using the smaller brushes now than I did with, when I was trying to do it with the bigger brushes. Yeah. yeah. I think the issue at the start is it just feels a little bit unwieldly, like having yeah, a yeah, bigger longer brush. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. because it's longer, it's obviously more flexible. Even yeah. if you're using quite a firm brush, having a very, very tiny, stubby one, yeah. it's obviously very, very firm because it's just quite short. True. Yeah. Going up to a longer size two or three, obviously it's got more flex in it. So it is a little bit of an adjustment, it's something to get used to. Yeah. But I think it's really, really beneficial to start practicing with one as much as possible. And like I said, treating it as a, what's the biggest brush I could get away with using for this task. Mm. Um, and particularly, I think this can come into play with like, if you're not comfortable yet doing really, really fine details with a big brush, just do all of your base coats with a bigger brush. Yeah. And then like, just just try like sizing up. Like you say, okay, I normally use a size triple zero for this. I'm gonna use a double zero and just like yeah. gradually work your way up. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up on the list, I've got a classic one. Uh, airbrushes make you a better painter or that they magically make you have all of these amazing blends and that model's really really good and the reason i can't paint like that is because i don't have an airbrush i, I there is I, there is an element of jealousy because when, when i look at a model uh when it's been, obviously been airbrushed i do think i do sort of sit there and think i need to learn how to do that because uh i can't paint like that and i'm never gonna be able to paint like that so I need to, I need to, at some point in my painting future, I need to sit at sort of, I need to learn how to use an airbrush. Mm. Uh, be, that, like it, it is nothing but a tool for a purpose mm. and like more for multiple purposes. Um, you, you, the thing with, the thing with it is, is like the first thing is I compare it to like a roll of when you're painting walls and DIY, mm. you wouldn't do everything on a wall with, with a brush. With a brush. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, it's not efficient and you get lots of brush marks, obviously. You can tell when a, when a, a mm. wall in a house has been painted just with a brush because you see all, the, see all the lines. The roller does a greater area faster and a better quality of smoothness, if that makes sense, or with no marks. So the airbrush is a tool in your arsenal to do certain specific things. Um, some people use it outside of that and push mm. and push the boundaries on it, which is amazing. And that's, that's good. But for, I would say for the general user of, of, of an airbrush, it's priming. If you use a surface primer or it's base coating or it's varnishing, or it's maybe doing some transitions or maybe doing some like glow effects or maybe doing uh, that. I think they're the, the general things that a good chunk of percentage of painters use it for, but then still switch to the brush as the other tool to yeah. do the rest of the work if you might if that makes sense i'm a firm believer that the all the airbrush does is save you time yeah and mm -hmm. it makes things more accessible for someone who isn't ready and doesn't have the skill yet to execute certain techniques with a brush yeah but i do not think there is a single thing that an airbrush can do that a paintbrush can't mm. not one you like you can like back in the day when airbrushes weren't used heavy metal were painting tanks land raiders and like all this know, kind of yeah. stuff with brushes like they still produce great like ph phenomenal miniatures the thing is is I mean, and there's, there's also there's, like spray cans to yeah, like yeah, rely yeah, on as well. Go, yeah, and I'd say well. spray cans, yeah. spray cans have got even more accessible with companies like Colorforge. Obviously, that uh, that we've done a can with them, that is a bit of a sponsored thing. But we, they're irrelevant of that. They've got loads of different mm. color cans, and even other manufacturers, you know, have got cans, etc. But I'd say that's got better. The thing with an airbrush is that the, the whole statement of it making you making you a better painter. I'd actually argue, and this is going to sound a bit convoluted, that it does have some inherent truth, but not in the way that a lot of people think, it may, as in mm. like the actual airbrush factually makes you better. I think the airbrush buys you the time to do more brush work, which then you actually get better through doing more brush work as opposed to I'm base coating a Land Raider and I've got to spend a whole day base coating it carefully and smoothly and get mm. my dilution right and drying it on. You'll get the blue on with the airbrush, and then you could start the paintwork with a paintbrush where you've got to be neat, sharp, smooth, clean, whatever, which actually means that you're working your muscle memory in your hand by making your brush control better. Like I'd say that the airbrush buys you the time to improve your painting yeah. with a brush. Yeah. So in not in a true form of the statement, as in it, an airbrush makes you a better painter, it doesn't in itself. But it does a bit. But it does a bit because it buys you the time. It, does that make sense? I think yeah. it's one of those things as well where it's similar to what we spoke about earlier with like accountability and whatnot. I think typically and commonly with beginners, I think especially is because there's a little bit of jealousy there and people see yes. something painted yeah. better than they feel that they can paint. They go, mm. it's because they had an airbrush. It's like this I'll easy thing to, to dismiss yeah. someone else's work. But the thing not to discount as well is the airbrush has a skill set to it, yeah. especially when you see it pushed to the extreme. Well, the, the likes of Ankel Harald is using the airbrush. Exactly. Like, it's like, yeah. like he airbrushes stuff and I'm like, how the hell does he do that? Mm. Like, give give uh, someone who's like, used an airbrush like it's not like you're an airbrush user or you're not. Like mm. there is skill within that. It's a tool, isn't it? Like a paintbrush. Exactly. The more you use exactly. it, and some obviously... people are better at it yeah, than others. So I think it's that, unfair yeah. to discount people's skill, um, yeah. talent, and effort to say, "Oh, well, I don't have an airbrush, and that's why I can't paint on them." I think like put some of the responsibility for that back on yourself. Yeah. Um, and say like, even without an airbrush, I could achieve X, Y, Z. Or think about how they've executed it in that way, or how you mm. could do it yeah. with a brush if you're not ready to get an airbrush yet. Or acknowledge as well that even if you did have an airbrush it doesn't mean that out of the gate from day one you're going to be out paint stuff like them oh. too no because most people what they do when they get an airbrush for the first time is they they get so excited to use it they bung painting it get a big splat on the model and go oh this is crap or i'm terrible yeah like like it doesn't do that for you like um and there's I varying quality of like airbrush blends as well it's like i you can tell when something has been airbrushed and that's mm. not to say that that makes it lower quality but it has got a different look to it than yeah. brush blending well, as well. I say this about like when we blend swords, if you do a hand blended one, you do an airbrush blended one, the airbrush one looks very clinical, like very, very clinical. Whereas almost like a brush blended one is like a marble. It's smooth and it's consistent. It's got great transitions, you know, but it inherently has some, I can only word it as like personality. That's the only way I can explain it. Like an airbrush yeah. sword has. This, it's got an aesthetic, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, like an airbrush sword. But has that's it, inherently like, just like physics. Like you're, you're not painting like thinned down liquid strokes on something, you are firing tiny atomized, particleized atomized yeah. dots of yeah. paint. You're painting with projected dots onto a surface. Hmm. It's almost similar to stippling in a way to me, like a, a finer, more... It's like a very, very super refined... Yeah, exactly. I get, yeah, I get what you're saying. Because you're yeah. not actually, never thought of it that you're not way, actually yeah. painting a brush stroke on, like the paint isn't being dragged across the surface. It's 
tiny, tiny dots being fired at it. And you can see that in extremes. When someone hasn't thinned paint properly with an airbrush, you see very, very big flex. Yeah, and that's basically just like a enlarged, more zoomed in example of what's mm. actually happening. Yeah. Because even with very, very thin, very, very fine, smooth airbrush gradients, yeah. if you take a photo of it and you zoom in, or if you get out a magnifier or whatever, you can see them. Like they mm. are there. Yeah. And again, that's not to say that that means it's lesser quality or anything. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it goes back to my point of, it's not the same thing as doing it with a brush. A no, brush has right. a different finish than an airbrush does. Seeing someone who's painted something exceptionally well, yeah. with an airbrush or not, just saying, oh, it's good because they had an airbrush, I think is a complete falsehood. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. If you're a fan of the show and you want to support us, then you should know that we have dropped some really cool merch on the Siege Studios shop. We've got several shirt designs with this really cool graphic on it. I've been wearing mine all of the time for months now, and I genuinely get compliments constantly from people who have absolutely no idea what Warhammer is. The shirts are really nice, high quality cotton, and everything is in stock and dispatched by us. None of that print to order nonsense. So if you want to check out the designs for yourself and see the other merch that we have on the shop, head to the link in this episode's description or go to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. And if you use the code POD10 at checkout, you'll save 10% and you'll get a free sticker pack with your order. Uh, next up on the list, this is a fun one. You can't use metallics on a wet palette. Why not? So I, I, I I've never, understand. I've never actually ever heard of this no. myth before. I've, I've used. Oh, it. the only way I'll do it. I'll, I'll unpack the myth. Am I a doing little it bit. wrong? There's, a, there's a couple of <laughs> stages to this. Um, one thing I've commonly heard is you can't use metallics on a wet palette because mm. it will over thin them and then they won't work. Okay. And another one that I've heard, which I find very, very bizarre, is that if you put metallic paints on a wet palette, it makes all of your other paints on the palette shiny. No. And this is something that if you're I think them, as experienced painters we can speak to this obviously. But again, I like I, I don't want to like assume knowledge or cast judgment on anyone who is new to painting yeah. and doesn't have the established knowledge base that a more experienced painter would have. Um, but that is definitely a commonly heard it was something that when I was first starting out painting, relying on other um, I guess more like amateur and beginner painters for advice. That was something that I heard kicked around a lot. It's yeah. something that since I've seen online spoken about as well. So it's definitely something that people have said mm. um, they, they, does, metallic, meta, metallic paints behave slightly differently because of their makeup because of the what's actually in the paint yeah. you, you've obviously got the metallic flakes uh, the mica or the aluminium and they did and you've obviously got the medium as well but they they do behave differently to an acrylic paint um in the sense of just the way that they, they when they, they separate a little bit easier sometimes obviously if you introduce the mediums or waters and things like into it um but i've never had a problem even right, but I mean, I used before I used a wet palette, and I was just doing dry a dry palette, for example. Like the they, the behaviour of those paints compared to acrylics mm. translates from one to the other, Does that, from a wet palette to a plastic palette or surface. Yeah, like I, I understand, I, I can kind of understand because of the separation that like that. But the only reason your other paints will be getting shiny is if you're literally getting the metallic them and putting it in yeah. the paint. Yeah. Like, I think you know, where like, let one run into the other. Yeah, I yeah. I think yeah. where that probably comes from is someone has um, been using a water pot with their metallics and then they've been going back and maybe thinning paint with it. So if you're using a wet palette, you've got metallics on there mm. and then you're rinsing your brush off in your water pot. And then maybe at a later stage, they've got, say, some red on their wet palette and they're dipping into their water palette maybe. for some water to thin it. Perhaps yeah. they're introducing some of the metallics that are left over in the water pot, if that makes yeah. sense. Or maybe maybe that's where it comes or from. The only way I can think is if, it, if your metallics leach onto the whatever you've got underneath your wet palette, you know, the sponge or the tissue yeah, yeah. or whatever you're using, and it sort of travels underneath the paper, maybe. maybe yeah. I don't know. but uh, Well, it's not something I've... I validated, I'll say, personally. That, no. I think, um, like I say, I can see where it comes from. I think part of the issue with this as well is, like you said, metallics being a little bit different in how the paint behaves. They over thin yeah. quite differently to how regular paint over thins. Yeah. And I think this kind of like bleeds in with a, another myth that I've heard of like wet palettes just automatically thin your paint when you put them yeah. on there, which I don't think is true. I think that no. if a wet palette is correctly so. set up, all it's really doing is just delaying the drying yeah. time yeah, of the paint. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, like you don't just put your paint on the wet palette and it gets thin because it's, it's on there. Okay, you have to use, introduce yeah. something. But into again, it. I think yeah. where that comes mm. from perhaps is uh, I mean, we've done a, a James done a fantastic uh, demonstration of how to set up the wet palette on a previous episode. I'll put that up there. But I think where that perhaps comes from is people have set up the wet palette, 
There's a lot of water, standing water, yeah, yeah. moisture on top of yeah, the surface. Yeah, and obviously if you put the put, put the brush onto the surface and mm. there's a massive puddle there, it's going to go everywhere. So like, yeah. yeah, you know, like, yeah, I think, yeah, there are a lot of things about, about that that's interesting actually. But I, yeah, I've never heard of those before, like, being honest. But um, but yeah, like just to debunk those, that that that's not the case. I think like, again, metallics behave differently. They behave differently on any surface that you put them on in the sense of the dilution and the way that they are. And, and, and yeah, like I think you just need to, need to just, exp- as I said, you'd only learn that through, ex- through putting them on the palette and experimenting yeah, and getting sure. used yeah. to it, you know. So, I really like metallics on the wet palette, actually, because I, I like them. to yeah. mix metallics a lot. Like as mm, I'm yeah. um, highlighting, I like to just add a tiny amount of silver into my gold or a yeah. brighter color into the dark metal. Or that a I'm bit doing. of black into the metallic. Yeah, I think yeah, that, yeah. like, I don't know why people disconnect how you can use metallic paints. That to me, they're no different to any other paint. Yeah. I like glazing with metallics, I like blending with metallics. I think you can do anything that you do with a normal paint yeah. Yeah. with a metallic. I wouldn't have even thought of using a me- metallic paint on any other palette other than my wet one anyway. I wouldn't have known any different. When, I, when so. I used to paint with the dry palette all the time, like I, I, yeah. it was exactly the same. But I've heard but, the same thing about like washes and other products and stuff as well. Yeah, I think I mean, people... Everything goes on the wet palette first anyway. Yeah. anyway so and yeah. I think. It, it thins down anyway on the wet palette so yeah it would save me a job if it did didn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> next up this is one that we've spoken about previously as well a little bit uh this is sort of a bit of the stigma around grimdark so i think the myth mm. around this is that grimdark has to be weathered streaking grime battered models mm. um and i think we've spoken a little bit how like grimdark to us means something slightly different maybe I, I, i'll always open this by saying that grim dark is uh an ambiance or mood that's what it is mm. it's it's like a, it's it's a feel of the model as opposed in my mind like when i remember i mean just to, i'm just a segue slightly like the artwork we have on the walls is from mm. like second edition john blanche is, is john blanche is the og king of king of grim dark and he used to have articles of in white dwarf about painting grim dark yeah his artwork it, it has that grim dark feel and vibe but like if you look at like the second ed cover art it's more it's more vibrant than you could possibly imagine mm. you know like so i see it more as 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 a mood or feel it's like going into a gallery and seeing pieces that are just done maybe in black and white and they have a, a, a dark feel to them or they have like or you have other types of expressionism that portrays a certain feel or vibe when you look at the artwork or stuff like, like that. Gothic feel. Like, yeah, or exactly. You know. like, and the thing is, is mm-hmm. like, that's not to say on the other flip side of it, that it can't be weathered, chipped, grimy, dirty, all those kind of things. Mm. But I think the, the, the navigation point for doing something in that style shouldn't just be about that, as in weathered and, uh, weathered and damage. It should be about the mood or feel that it portrays. Because mm. like, the, I think the height of Grim Dark for me was around about third edition when the Black Templar box came out. If you look at the Black Templar third edition artwork, that felt very Grim Dark. Mm. It felt like that 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 I think that was where it was really getting a kind of. It, where, I think that's where it kind of started um, getting its own kind of thing. Like if you think like Maxim from uh, from Games Workshop, he he uh, he paints Black Templars in the exact linear style of that artwork. Yeah. His models are still vibrant, bright. Like you look at some of the gun casings, all those kind of things, but the models are grim dark. Does yeah, that make yeah. sense? Yeah. You know? I think maybe where this originates from is um, in lieu of a lot of the tutorials and things coming out like around speed painting. I think a lot of people have found that speed painting and grim dark kind of go like hand in hand. They yeah, work they really, do, really yeah. nicely together. And I think that's perpetuated like a lot of visuals online and on social media and on YouTube mm. and whatnot of grim dark stuff. And it's super, super battered and weather because that's quite quick for speed painting. And it looks very, very effective, very, very mm. vibrant, very punchy. looks great on the table. And I think that those lines have kind of got blurred a little bit. And I think we're unfortunately starting to see like less grimdark stuff yeah. that's cleaner or got more color to it. Well, well even I, just like armor chipping and things like that, that, that conveys grimdark. It, a, yeah, it's not. Way. Yeah, it's a narrative, isn't it? It's yeah. a, it's, a, it's a mood. Yeah. That's exactly it. Like, uh, and that's the thing that, that I always, I've always seen it as that, like, because there's no looking back at the early artworks of John or like, uh, or, or other things that are out there, like they're still colorful and bright yeah. and stuff like that, but they have this feel or vibe. And that's the only way I can explain it. Like we've said, it, you know, on a previous episode, I can't remember the number of the episode now, but, but there was a golden demon winning dreadnought that was painted by an amazing that's painter. Right, yeah. And it was so like, it was like, it had that feel, that evil, grim, dark feel or vibe mm. to it, but it was, 
it had weathering and damage and all that kind of stuff. But the, the but it wasn't just a wash or something thrown over model, obviously, because it's a winning GD entry. It's it's it had hours and hours of individual work done to it to create that overall weathered and damaged look that took yeah. ages, but the whole piece conveyed that feel or vibe. You know, and that that I think that's one of the things I don't think you need to go the quick and easy route and just putting slapping stuff on to get that vibe. Like there is a top end of that spectrum as well, mm. where you can invest tens and tens and tens and tens of hours to get it to that feel or that look, if that makes sense. I think that's something that really, I want to break in that stigma of it being just quick and easy or weathered and damaged and battered to hell. It doesn't have to be, you know, to be, yeah. to be that, that vibe. Yeah. Mm. Uh, final one on my list. Sorry, Duncan. Two thin coats. Mm. This is an interesting one to me because right. I think that in principle, the idea of two thin coats Makes as like a mantra. Yeah. Perfect. I love that that's become something that's repeated a lot and passed down to well, new painters. I was going to, just going to say, as a new painter... <laughs> going, Critical information, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, not taking the paint straight out of the pot and whacking it onto the... On yeah, the, a model. You know, model. getting out of that and going, well, all right, I'll use, I'll use two, two coats then, you know, thin yeah. it down a bit and do that. And, Ob yeah. and, and obviously, and, as you progress, you use more and more and more and more. But where but yeah. where this made it onto the list was, I remember distinctly as a beginner painter, mm. hearing that a lot and getting confused when two thin coats wasn't enough because I perhaps thinned it more than them. And then that meant that two, yeah. two coats was poor coverage. So I'm like, am I not thinning the paint enough? And yeah. so on and so forth. And also, sometimes you need to thin that because of the way the paint behaves perhaps yeah. it needs to be thinned down more therefore you need more layers or especially once you start to get into like other techniques and stuff mm. i think that i got caught up a lot on the word two and the number two mm. and i think that as a factual thing as a factual mm. thing yeah, of right, like okay. this should require two coats yeah. yeah whereas i think the idea with this is thin your paints first yeah, yeah. I'll do it in multiple layers i was mm. to say anything and this is why that that analogy i'd say analogy but that that's that's that statement is really beneficial when spikes cottoned on and done so well is because anything that teaches a painter to not put paint on straight like ribena it's like necking a bottle of ribena you wouldn't do it you know like you know so like you ever like, accidentally done that yeah, like, no like <laughs> No, no I, I remember like, you know, no. it's like one in the morning, you need a drink, you make yourself some Ribena. Oh, You're not yeah, thinking yeah. straight. You yeah. just you can Next, take a sip. Yeah, yeah. We've, all, <laughs> we've, all, we've all done that. But like, mm. but, um, but I think, I think anything that teaches people and painters to do that is beneficial. And that's why it's done so well as a thing. And, and, and the, the, it's a great, you know, obviously Duncan's got his paint range now as well and that stuff. So it's a great marketing statement. But I think if you strip back that to what the is core basics of what it is, it's just making sure that people don't, heavily overlay paint on yeah. miniatures. It's not is, quite as cool a catchphrase, but I wish it was multiple thin coats. Yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't, doesn't really work. Doesn't really work. Doesn't really work. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. Two, thin, two thin coats is definitely a good starting point for people. 100%. But uh, you don't know this, but my, my daughter painted her first model at the weekend. Wow. I mean, this is... Yeah. Oh, this is, this is, yeah. this she, is paint, she painted her first model. So the first... This is like thing, a bullet. Like, do, 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 do. The first thing we were trying to get her to do was put paint on the palette yeah. and added some water to it. Yeah. So she wasn't just straight dunk out it, the pot. Dunk it, dunking it on. Yeah. Yeah. So, even, um, yeah. so she's, I, even, she even, she's, it's been drilled into her, uh, you know, two thin coats straight away. Good. It's like a That's generational a thing. Generational it's yeah. handed thing. down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Generations. I, I think where it goes into a bit more, a bit more sort of depth of, of that is when we start talking about individual paints, behavior and personality, as we always say, like every paint in a range, if it's the same manufacturer behaves completely almost completely different to each other unless the range has been designed to be consistent mm. which is quite hard when you think of the chemical makeup of paints and all those kind of things um there are ranges out there that are a lot closer together um but i still think inherently you have paints in there like typically a lot of the ones that are stigmatized like your whites your yellows your oranges your, your pinks and all those colors there mm. they tend to be harder to get a solid opaque coat with lesser amounts of dilution if yeah. that makes sense so um what one of the things that I would say is that like that analogy or that statement of two thin coats or like multiple layers or whatever, I think that there is so much variance in how much you actually need to do with each incremental paint. So some paints might be two yeah. layers, some paints, it might be three or four or five or six, you know, mm. to get that solid opaque layer. And I think that's one of the things that that statement and that, that, that branding is really good for is it starts teaching painters to don't put it on straight, dilute it down, 
do X amount of layers, insert your favorite number here, whatever, yeah. like to, to get it to a solidly opaque finish. And I think yeah. that that's the thing that that statement has done, but there isn't, it, it would be wrong to say that the, the two layers applies to every single paint because mm. Some paints are thinner than others. Some are not thinner. Some paints don't have as much pigment in them. Sometimes the pigment doesn't cover as well in that paint. Like I always say this on classes and stuff. You need to learn your paint like a library and, and so that you make informed choices as you're painting. Yeah. What that paint is for. Is it good? Is it is it a solid coverage black once you've diluted it down a couple of layers or does it need only a tiny bit of water to go on solidly? Or is it a green that is quite thin and needs multiple layers it's better to airbrush with it i mean the, my, the classic for me is my favorite color which is blood red it's absolutely horrendous with a brush and i'm quite happy to say it's horrendous that. full mm. stop and you know it <laughs> talking nonsense george <laughs> but but if you atomize it and put it through an airbrush it's, yeah. it's amazing you know like and and again it, it, it like it's very similar to like warpstone glow which is a color i've used as like a benchmark warpstone glow is a great green lovely and saturated it's amazing if you're painting salamanders and all different things like that however it doesn't go on as well with a brush or and you, and like with a, one or two layers, you need mm. to put lots of layers thinly and dry them on to get a solid solid coverage or, on, as I said, atomize it through the airbrush. Blood red is exactly the same. And like I think that's one of the things that really should be, like you've done with your daughter, Paul, is, is like is, is teach that core competency thing at the very beginning to understand that like it is about adding progressive yeah. layers of something to get it to that perfect finish if that makes sense yeah perfect so, so yeah, yeah. yeah. No, she, had, she had a good time doing it question of the week time thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week if you have a question that you'd like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast please leave it in the comments down below uh this week we have a question from ash blatt who says when competition painting how much brush or airbrush work should you use where's the line between skill and mechanical assistance I feel an airbrush getting 80% of the color blends done on a big panel takes away from skilled brush painters. So we spoke about this a little bit earlier, actually. Yeah. I, can, yeah. I can jump on this like a grenade if you want. <laughs> Go for it. it. So, Take one for the team. I used to think that an airbrush, before mm. I used an airbrush, many, many, many years ago, I used to think, oh, yeah, an airbrush is cheating. You know, it's like, blah, blah, and that's but most, now you that's use most, it, it's okay. That's the most stupid. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm quite happy okay. to put my hand up and say it. it's sure. the most stupid thing I've ever thought in my life. Mm. And, I, and I will quite happily and humbly just admit my complete lunacy. All right, okay. Because the thing is, is like, it, it, as we said, it's a tool. Um, but focusing on the question from the, from the commenter, like, um, it really it's for the, for the tool that you're doing or for the job that you're doing. So mm. one is painting competition is about quality. So if an airbrush puts the paint on smoother and better, then you can do it with a brush. Then ultimately that's going to deliver a better, better piece for you. However, most stuff is either sketched on with an airbrush as in you get the main color on and then it switches to brushes typically. Um, and ultimately it should be about skill and as we and said, that, I think it discounts what we said before as well is like there is a skill to use curve it. with mm. using the airbrush, yeah, of course especially mm. at a at very, very high level. end competition yeah. Exactly. level. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. But like it doesn't take away from it. And then I, th I, th I think that's, that's the thing. I, 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 the vast amount of entries that are out there, you have some entries that are completely brush painted. You have some entries that, are, that have got way more airbrush paint and stuff on them. And it's, it's cause it's art at the end of the day. Like you, it's you can't really discount too much and if you if you just fired an airbrush at it mm -hmm. yeah and done no brush work then at that point probably it's not going to be seen as 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 highly as work that's got a load of skilled brush work on it that maybe has freehand on it or it yeah. has subtle color blends or subtle insinuation yeah. of color i don't think it's like a better or worse thing i think it's just a style and finish it's a stylistic execution. and it doesn't really yeah. i don't think using an airbrush or not demonstrates any indication of what your skill level is it's how it's been executed it's been cheated, yeah like but, i think you just personally i would say it's a lot of painters use it to get main color on and then they switch to a brush hmm. um and then like sometimes the initial part of an effect or the initial part of something is done i i'm you know i i've known painters that have stenciled on with an airbrush a shape hmm. yeah and then they've gone in with a brush and then create turn that shape into freehand the airbrush makes that initial mark that then they can go yeah. in and then do the, mm. the actual thing so it's, it's got various uses it doesn't mitigate from the quality of the piece and it doesn't it doesn't make the piece less stunning or I, less i don't like think it matters how you got there you should look at the piece yeah. and go is this it, a good piece or not does yeah. it look nice like yeah. even at that high it, it say for example you know really high end level competition is it 
how difficult is it even to tell that you can you can is... see you can see sometimes that stuff has been clinically painted yeah. with an airbrush but then you, I'd actually you... argue it's fairly easy to tell if something's yeah. been airbrushed or not okay. just because of like I said of you are firing tiny projected dots yeah. or something. Don't get me wrong. Some stuff looks like more airbrushy than others just due to technical execution of it. Mm. Um, and sometimes on the very, very high end, it can be very, very hard to tell. I'm not yeah. saying I'm, I can perfectly spot every single one, but I would say that in the majority of cases, there is a look and finish to it that you can tell. Mm. You know, like I, I said, it's not about seeing that as better or worse. It's just going, okay, that's how they've done that. Yeah, you yeah. know, I was saying earlier about the sword and how an airbrush perfectly blended yeah, airbrush yeah. sword is, is like very clinical and then mm. a, a, a brush blended one has got like almost like a a marbled kind of depth to it or it's yeah. got like that cut even though you've got smooth transitions. It's, it's just, you can just, it, you can just tell. It's almost like we were saying about Grim Dark where it has an ambiance where it has like a feel or vibe. It, yeah. it, an airbrush model just has a feel or vibe. It doesn't, dictate or mitigate from the quality of in, the in the same way that a dry brushed model is going to look different to one that's been sat and edge highlighted like it's yeah. just a finished property I yeah. Think. yeah but that's again that doesn't make it a people better can, or people worse do incredible model. stuff no. with a dry brush like yeah. it's it's not yeah. a better or worse thing i think it's just yeah it's a different way of they getting are, to your destination all those things are tools in the toolbox that's it yeah, yeah and you should use them collectively to the for the best thing that you've done yeah and sure that, that's the that's the way to yeah. look at it yeah Okay, on that note, Hobby Hacks is our weekly tradition on the podcast where we share a little quick tip, a hobby hack with you. It can be like a technique recommendation or a product recommendation, something like that. And uh, I think we've got a classic paint perspective demo teed up for you. Uh, James, take it away. Blue Peter time. So what I want to talk about is painting faces uh, and more specifically painting the eyes on a model. Um, it's something that I ask on classes all the time about how people execute eyes and paint eyes. And one of the things which, um, which a lot of people struggle with is their non is the the eye on their non dexterous side? So what I mean by that is, for me as a left hander, when I'm looking at a face, that model's right eye mm. or the one that I'm looking at, which is on the left, is the easiest for me to paint. All right, yeah. Okay. And the reason for that is because I can look and see where the point is of the brush, and I can look down the uh, look down the brush at a diagonal angle. So if you look at it this way, I'm looking like this at the brush from this angle and allowing me to paint the eye there like that, okay? What happens when you jump across to paint the other eye? You're obscuring. Your hand, <laughs> your hand, your hand then moves yeah. in front of you, yeah. yeah, and you can't see anything. So that is what makes the person then turn the head upside down, moving the eye on the non-dextrous side onto the so dextrous side yeah. so that you can again see. But the problem is, hmm. is that the head or face becomes unrecognizable. I don't, I'm pretty sure nobody looks at someone upside down in real life. Um, it's not easy to do Batman? That. Maybe Batman, yeah. Or Spider-Man. Upside <laughs> down face from Family Guy. <laughs> Probably, yeah. So getting back to the point. Now, really, what it is that makes, this is a hack, a real quick hack to basically make it easier for you to ultimately paint your okay. non-dexterous, the non-dexterous side of the, of, the, of, the, of the face. All you need to do is your, the, the hand that you hold the paintbrush with Mm. The elbow of that of that arm needs to move into the desk, okay? So that what you can then do is look down the brush and do a full stroke outward. Does that make sense? So if you look at me moving my position, normally I'd paint like this. I paint the eye that's my most dexterous on. Rather than turn the head upside down, and then it's not a face, and it's like the craziest thing to look at ever, and, I'm, and then I make a mistake, and I've got to reset it, put more paint on. Mm. All I do is literally elbow into the desk, which then creates the scope or space for you to look down the brush and do a push stroke or pull stroke, whichever way you want to do the brush stroke. Sort of like side to side, side left to and right. Side to yeah. side in that eye socket, okay? It's, you should move as a, as, a, as a person, not the object. Yeah. So again- Which is funny because it's sort of the opposite rule to what we normally say, which is move the miniature around to make it easier for yourself while painting, which we would do with- other stuff. Other stuff. But, but with the eyes but specifically eyes, on the face. It, like, it's such an important detail on a miniature yeah. that like executing it consistently and sharply is is like, it's there's no, it's either you hit or miss. Does that yeah. make sense? I was, I, is, okay, I was kind of taught to paint the, like you saying before with your, I'm, I'm right-handed. Yeah. 
So I, I would paint the left eye first as I'm looking at the face. So that'd be the harder. So you're left. You're left handed. No, I'm right handed. You're right handed. So, so I was always taught to paint the left uh, the left eye first, the one that's harder for him. The one harder for to paint, and then do the right eye. Yeah, I, I I understand that totally. I mean, yeah, if, if you if you paint it that way, that's fine. I still can't paint yeah. it that way. No, <laughs> but, I'm still but it's, a, it's honestly when you try it and do it, I'll try. Okay, it. Yeah, I promise you because again, and remember the golden rule is whatever hand holds the paintbrush. Yeah, the elbow of that hand is the what you move into the desk. Yeah. Leaning into it gives you the space to then look down the brush at the same... Cause if and you're you, also turning the head and you're, to the side. There, oh, you can you? do, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, but it's no mm. different because if, if you look at me move now, so if I go like this and I'm painting the eye that my mm. dexterity is good at, the angle of my perception of the brush onto the head it's, it's is just, no different. Yeah, Does that make same, sense? Yeah. So look, I'm, now I'm painting the other It's eye. like your point yeah. of view doesn't change. Exactly, yeah. that's exactly it. And it's purely by the elbow being in the in the desk as opposed to being balanced or braced on the front of the desk. So here I can paint the, his right eye, which is the left eye, me looking at it. Yeah, and then I just go in, and then you can do the other and then I can do the other eye. You're like I kind of looking down the barrel of the paintbrush, Ex so to speak. exactly. Yeah, yeah. you're yeah. looking down yeah. the brush because that is the thing when you when you strip it right back. That is the thing which is actually stopping you from executing it without mm. turning it upside down. It's this you just can't see because your hand moves in front of your face, and you're like oh. And if and what a lot of people do is they actually move their head this way to then to then try and do it, which still looks weird. So if, <laughs> yeah. so so if you so you might as well just lean in a bit, get, yeah. get your elbow in, look down the brush, and then do the stroke the other way, and that will yeah. solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. It's that a little hack that I, I think that the day I kind of like went, oh, I'll just do that, and it makes it easier. It changed the way I painted mm. all details on faces. It gave me an improvement of control and just it broke it broke. Got rid of that. Oh, I've got to turn it upside down. Or I've got to do this to it. You know, I should try that next time. Give it nice. a bosh. Okay. Uh, on that note, then I think we'll round it out there. Massive thank you to everyone for watching this week's episode of Paint Perspective. We're going to drop over now to our bonus post show segment for our patrons. So if you'd like to tune into bonus extended versions of the podcast without ads, uh, then check the link in the description to our Patreon. And in addition to that, you also get access to hundreds of tutorials, which we update every single week. Uh, other than that, we thank you. Uh, don't forget to leave your suggestions for question of the week and so forth. Uh, we look forward to chatting with you down in the comments and we will see you next week. Because I rarely painted aircraft. I bit love building them, but I never really painted them. But I, but I spent ages building this Lancaster bomber and the cupboard fell, obviously crushing this beautiful... Yeah, yeah. And I, I still haven't spoken to her till this day. 